now on Dragonflix. Linnea Quigley's Scary Movie Biography Show. Featuring stories never heard before of movies she has made. Return of the Living Dead. Savage Streets. Night of the Demons. Sir Ordy Babes in the Slime Ball Arama. Cannibal. Linnea Quigley's Horror Workout. Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers. Graduation Day. These are just a few that will be brought to you exclusively by Dragonflix. I'm Linnea Quigley, and I want to tell you all about Return of the Living Dead. How did you get to be in the film? I got to be in the film by going on an audition and reading for a casting director. And what happened was the casting director liked me. She'd seen me in Silent Night, Deadly Night. Well, she cast me in it. Oh. And so she brought me back in to read for this. So. I passed that, then I came back and read for the producer, the director, and the casting director, and I guess they liked me. They told me that when they were casting it before, which was like six months previous, they had gotten this one girl that was going to play my part, but in after they stopped in the interim, she got pregnant. So I got the part. I had to all. Oh, I had to audition with my famous, do you ever fantasize? And roll around on the ground and dance and, and with Miguel Nunez. And I didn't know if I got it yet, but I got a call and they said, you're hired. And so I'm like, yes. So the character's name was Legs when I read it. I thought it was cool. So what's the film about? Return of the Living Dead is about a bunch of punk rockers who meet a bunch of just, mm, what would you call them? Just workers that work in a, in a warehouse and somebody that owns the warehouse and a mortician that works across from the warehouse. And it's about those two meeting against all odds and coming together to fight zombies that are risen from the grave because of this acid rain. And it's very exciting, actually. And who was the director of the film? Can you tell anything about him? The director of the film was Dan O'Bannon, and I was so impressed because he had written Alien and also Blue Thunder. But Alien really got me. I said, wow, this is pretty cool because Dan O'Bannon has written this. He's going to direct it. I was very, very excited to do the film. And who was in the cast with you? The cast was really interesting. They had James Karen, who was mainly known for a lot of different parts that he played. None like this. And Don Kalfa, who had been in like Barney Miller and all these really crazy shows, uh, 10 with the big eyes. And there was Clue Gulliger, who was a cowboy star. And I thought it was the best cast in the world. Also, a bunch of us, kind of unknowns really, that were in, you know, just low budget things. There was Miguel Nunez, Brian Peck. John Philbin, Joel Shepard, uh, Beverly Randolph. Uh, am I forgetting anybody? Hmm. I don't. Oh my God! Mark Venturini, who played Suicide, who was like the best guy in the world, and I guess you know he didn't make it in this world, unfortunately, and he's gone. Would you have imagined in a million years that this film? 
we made the film, I had no idea what we were doing. I thought we were doing just another horror film. Everybody did. And it was amazing that it is like lasted as long as it has. And people that are 15 and 16 and younger love the film. They like the music, they like the whole punk aspect. And I get a lot of times, they wish they would have grown up with these kind of movies and it's their favorite and it's, it's exciting that they remember it and they love it so much. So do you have any specific memories about making the film? When I was making the film, I did not know what I was getting into. I did not know about the horrible special effects on a person. I did not know the coldness of a night in LA filming just all night long. I didn't know how rugged it would be. I didn't know what it would be like to be buried alive in mud. I didn't know what it would be like to have zombies eat my brains. So it was a rude awakening. I remember I didn't even um, sign my contract because I thought, I don't know if I could make this. It was like being in the army or navy or something. It was just so grueling. And being painted with white paint that they painted different things with that wouldn't come off. It was a very grueling shoot, for me at least, because I was outside in the elements and doing a lot of things the others didn't have to do. But I enjoyed it afterward. Is there any one particular thing that stands out for you about the film? I think the one thing that really stands out for me on the film is that it was such a team effort. We all worked together as best as we could to make it as best as we you know, could possibly do it. And Dan O'Bannon was like fighting for every shot because they wanted to cut his budget back and we all believed in what we were doing. And I think it's the most kick-ass movie that is around. I honestly do. I don't think that about many of my films, but I love it. So did anything bad happen on the set, or was it basically a happy film to work on? I would say the film was not that happy. I was happy, but it was very tense because of, you know, Dan and the budget, and he was tired. He developed a tick. He was going after like the third day. I think he was just very nervous, and I think sometimes he would take it out on the actors. Like one day, Beverly Randolph had to do this scene where she's going down the stairs, which you'll probably remember, and there's a stair there that creaks. Well, she kept hesitating at the stair. So after a while, Dan was getting upset and said, don't hesitate, don't hesitate. So she kept hesitating. He sent her back up to, you know, get, you know, all dirty again and to make up, which was upstairs. And while she was up there, they decided to change the stair to a breakaway stair. Well, this time when she came down the stairs, she fell through, which was supposed to be done by a stunt woman. Well, I saw her the next day and she was really bruised from head to toe. I mean, really bad. And luckily she didn't press charges or anything, but it was bad. That was not good. That was like horrible. That day. Another bad thing that happened was I got strep throat with all the running around and being cold and buried and all that. And I was at home for three days. I was off. And I got a call like around three in the morning. And the guy, when I answered it, said, I'm gonna call you three times, and the third time you're gonna be dead. And I remember that from something, an urban legend, and it scared me so bad that I thought, oh my God, if he calls me again, I might be dead. So I 
you know, took the phone out of the, out of the outlet because there were dial phones back then. And so I thought, okay, if he can't call me, they can't kill me. And the next night I had plugged in the phone again because I needed to get calls. Of course, I get another call. I'm going to call you three times and you're going to be dead. The third call. So I was freaking out. I said, oh my God, I'm not going to answer the phone anymore. And it would just ring that horrible shrill sound. And the third night I was asleep and I woke up and I had my beta up on the um, TV and it was flashing. Now when it's flashing, it means you have no electricity. Like, so I thought, Oh my God, this guy has like cut the electricity and he's coming to get me. And I was so scared. I was so scared. I dialed 611 instead of 911. I called information, which didn't help at all. And the police came out and I told them the story. And of course they didn't bug the phone and see, you know, trace it and see who was calling me. Cause they don't do that really, unless it's really serious. Nobody was kidnapped. So I thought he's coming to get me. So I went out that day and I got an M1. You know, one of those um, really cool rifles that is semi-automatic. I thought, if he comes in, I'm gonna shoot him. I had my position ready and back of the bed, everything. But he never called again. And the, I told the production company and they were very concerned for my well-being and tried to figure out who it was but nobody ever figured it out. So what special effects and stunts were used in the film? Well there were special effects that included me having this well there were two makeup artists special effects artists and the one he was very slow. He was kind of like a bear. He was this big, Bill Munns was his name, and he was this big, burly guy, and he would just come to the set very slow, and I guess they didn't like his makeup very well. I remember the first day having to wear the, the white makeup, it would kept cracking, and then they had to figure out something else to do. But taking it off, I said, what am I going to use? It's not coming off and he handed me gasoline, which I didn't know was bad. I used a little bit of it and I thought, well, if somebody's smoking, I might, you know, go up in flames. So they replaced him with Kenny Myers and I had to go through another prosthetic piece again. Now the first one, the mouth was where it was supposed to be and it was, you know, scary and everything but they didn't like it so Kenny Myers designed one that's mouth was way down here so I couldn't drink at the time I smoked bad but um, I couldn't smoke I was in it many many hours now I had a request I said if I have to wear this again because we were doing pickup shots I said I want a Valiant because I, I, I hate special effects on my face, I hate them. So they had a doctor come out, a doctor for a Valium, and administer a Valium to me with tweezers with this mask on. So I thought it was just really weird that they had a doctor come out. But we did it and I had to like push my chin out to like, bite at someone. It was very uncomfortable, but it's showbiz. So how would you rate this film compared to your other film? I would rate Return of the Living Dead high above any film I've ever done. Sorority Babes and the Slimeball Bolorama comes close, but Return of the Living Dead surpasses it by eons and eons. It's an amazing film. Everybody should see it. Everybody should like listen to it, listen to the soundtrack. And everybody should dress like one of the characters at least once in their life.
So if you had to compare this film to another movie, what would it be? Comparing Return of the Living Dead to another movie is hard to do. I don't, I don't know if there's really anything you can compare it to. Hmm. There's no comparison to any other film. This is a unique, original film. No one comes close. If you had to pick one thing that was a really good memory from this film, what would it be your best moment? I think the best moment of this film was in the beginning when we were getting our characters together and deciding what they would do, you know, as the scene went on and having two weeks of rehearsal time. But the best thing was when I was in the screening room and it got a lot of applause. That was really the best 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 and now when people come up and love it so I guess now when people love the film and the characters was this a very difficult film to make as an actor this wasn't a difficult film for me as an actor except the rain and the cold and the makeup effects and being attacked by zombies and pretty much the whole film. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was really fun being able to like just put in whatever you wanted to do at the moment. That's how I do it. I don't like think it out like Don Calfo or something who had everything planned. He was a German person that, you know, escaped you know, the Hitler regime, but I just like took it as one line at a time. Dan didn't make you any calf brains. I didn't have to eat any calf brains, but I did get on the set right when the little guy that runs out with the flippers was green from eating three day old, not refrigerated calf brains. He was throwing up. I said, well, I'm, I'm vegan, so no calf brains for me. No way. So when the film was released, what publicity did you do to promote the film? I remember that we did some things like for publicity at Hollywood Book and Poster but we didn't really, I didn't really do a whole lot, except later I did Fangoria Magazine. They came out and did a story. I think that was my first time in Fangoria Magazine when they did that story on, on the set with Return of the Living Dead. I'm sure they didn't know it was gonna be a big hit, but there wasn't a lot of publicity for this in the beginning. It was kind of like, to me, it was like a sleeper, and then all of a sudden it kind of exploded once everybody starts seeing it and really enjoying it. So if you're talking to somebody who's never seen it before, can you tell me why they should watch it? People should watch Return of the Living Dead because it's a moment in time when punk rock ruled and what would happen if there was a zombie apocalypse? I think a lot of people would like that to happen. We're getting close with the coronavirus, but uh, this is different. This, this thing, you have to shoot them in the head. So take your classes at the firing range and get like watermelons and pretend they're brains and just shoot at them. So it's a fun romp. You'll have fun, you'll hear great music, you'll just, be scared, not be scared, laugh. It's everything in one. Hi, it's Ben and Sonny. Welcome to the Return of the Living Dead panel. Ow! So, uh, without further ado, we're going to start introducing everybody. First and foremost, uh, a legend, Karen.
Next we have the lovely Drew Shepard. Next, we have Linnea Quigley. <laughs> Up next, Mr. Brian Peck. Mr. Tom Matthews. Jägermeister. 
People, people will just pass out booze if you just show up. I just want to say one thing we all owe Beverly, a great uh, and sweet love to, because Beverly really holds everybody together and, and runs, runs the little group beautifully with a... She is not just a pretty face with naught behind it. No, she has a very nice behind. Her. What do I say? I don't have anything to say yet. Oh God. Okay. I'm saying something. Go to the chicken. Normally, Jewel won't shut up, but then you hand her a microphone and she has nothing to say. I don't believe it's true. Come on, Jewel. Well, let me ask you guys, you know, especially with the addition of James here, it's a very special reunion. How do you guys feel about, yeah, you, yeah, you're a very special man. <laughs> with the addition of it's a very special reunion, I mean, how is it for you guys that you've been doing reunions for years now and just... The fandom has grown and grown and grown from the day that it kind of took off. What's that like for you to have that just love that you did a few years ago and it just keeps growing? Crazy. It's crazy. And then we have their Facebook friends here and it's just you walk up and you get to see them and you guys are like, oh my gosh, how's your family? How's the kids? It's crazy. It's wonderful. Hi. You love Facebook, don't you? I'm not on I'm not on no, as much as I used he to. He plays Candy Crush. I, I'm busy. I'm the only time I see him on Facebook yeah, is Farmville and Candy Crush. I used to do that damn Farmville thing. Now we're just like addicted. <laughs> it's true. I had to cut myself off of that thing. It was just like taking up too much time. Yeah, it's true. He was my man on his kid's show. It was so funny. Yeah, my kid's kid got on it. Yeah, he's the funniest kid. He's just like Candy Crush. Yeah, he's the funniest kid. My kids got on <laughs> pretending to be me, or I was pretending to. I, I said I blamed them for being on my Facebook. They're playing uh, Farmville. Yeah. Joel, yeah. Joel no, Carla's still on it. She's still playing the darn thing. She's her <laughs> world is huge. I didn't know. It's a monster. This has nothing to do with how special our <laughs> view is. <laughs> no, that's true. I just want to say happy birthday to Clue. He was telling me, he was telling me a story the other the other day how you know when you get older there's some things you can ex that's some, that consistent things in his life and he says at seven o'clock in the morning he'll he'll have a take a leak and at 7 15 he'll, he'll go to the bathroom go to number two and then 7 30 in the morning he'll wake up and just be you know, like a, clean it all up so uh, that's what we all have to look forward to okay but he still walks. I he still he walks. Yes. Yeah. I live in. <laughs> I hear no, I, I ran into the clue car. on. I was going down up La Brea, and Clue's walking across the crosswalk. I said, Clue, what are you doing walking across the crosswalk? I said, You'll make more money on Santa Monica. <laughs> Jesus he literally will walk ten miles. I, he lives in Hollywood, and I live about, I guess, like 10, 15 miles away. He was walking by my house. I'm like, what are you doing? No, I'm dead serious. So I picked him up and took him to my house. Let Clue talk about this. Clue, you should talk about this. He walks everywhere. Did you walk to the airport? <laughs> Did Ginger land on the panel? <laughs> oh, I guess not. Uh, I am 85 years old today, and I've never been kissed, and, uh... <laughs> Boy. Oh, oh, my God! Oh, oh good Lord. Did Ginger Lynn on the panel? That's ridiculous. I've never seen such a silly bunch of Film junkies in my life. <laughs> All of us are just film junkies, I guess. I, uh, most of you know that I'm a, 
Oh, maybe you don't. I'm a Cherokee Indian. And I was, my name, Clue, uh, 15 people have asked me, where did you get that name? I said, well, I was named like all Indian babies are named, Cherokee Indian babies anyway. When the baby's born, the first thing the mother sees, she names that baby. So when I was born, my mother looked out the window and saw a red bird flying overhead. And the Cherokee Indian name for red bird is Clu Clu. Clu Clu. So they call me Clu. I'm glad she didn't look out the window and see an outhouse. <laughs> Well, you can see why I'm 85. I... <laughs> so a question for all of you. You each played a very memorable role. Or, <clears throat> did the director allow you to add any of your personality into the role? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Dan was good. He had um, expectations, but he let your own personality kind of take over, like in... Um, the scene where we're all getting out of the car at the cemetery, when we first see the cemetery, I decided instead of going out the doors, I'd go over the windshield and slide down the hood. And he just, you know, let you kind of do what you wanted. Yeah, I think in the uh, audition process, he did a lot of his best work. You know, he made us, we all had to get together and work together. For a long time, just to get the job, he was looking for very specific qualities in each of us. And he saw qualities in each of us that we may not have seen in ourselves. And then he brought them out. That's so funny, in the movie. <laughs> and then the older we got, the more we would look back at the movie and say, like, wow, I really, I really wasn't, you know, for me, a nerd who was out of place and nobody liked me. But, you know, and I had that feeling inside, what the hell is so funny. <laughs> I, I, the director did a great job, and yeah, he did. Does Miguel hate us? Where's Miguel? Why is he here? No, here's what's so strange. We got an email from Miguel like three or four days ago saying, how come we're not at that convention? And we're like, get your ass over here. Where are you? It's an agent. He has a weird, is it? That's funny. We get booked for these conventions. He has someone who does it separately, and for some reason, he's not here. We miss you, Miguel. I think we ought to just mention if there's somebody not here who we wish dearly were here. Suicide. We're all here, and we should have gone to the cemetery. I don't know how far away it is, but it's here in Illinois. Yes. What's that? I'm so upset we didn't find that. He's buried here in Illinois. Mikey, do you know what city he's in? Somebody else, but you know. Party tonight at Mark's gravesite. No, I'm telling you. God, that'd be great. Probably not a great idea. It would be fitting. I like to party. How about the rest, uh, as far as the personalities into the character that they portray, James? I'm sorry. The the director allowing your own personality to be in the character that you portrayed in the film, were you able to... Did Dan allow you to bring some of your own personality to the character? No. no. <laughs> Dan, Dan was so good to work with. Uh, he had... It was, it was a new experience for him. I, I, I don't know, uh, we've all talked about it, but I always thought the greatest thing that happened to us was that the producer, Tom Fox, gave us a rehearsal time. And we rehearsed it like it was a play. And none of, no, I don't think anybody really knew each other before that. But by the end of that rehearsal, everybody had slept with everybody else. <laughs> And so they really knew each other, and they felt free with each other. And Jimmy is an amazing lover, by the way. <laughs> but it, it really, I think it, 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 we were talking, Clue was, Clue was talking, and he wasn't, he, he was not uh, in the rehearsals, and I regretted it enormously that he wasn't, and 
regrets because uh, he got he got into the thing late. I think because he was asking for so goddamn much money. <laughs> the rest of us were working for you know for coffee and cake. And you got Clue, cake? <laughs> <laughs> Clue wanted icing, but at any rate, but but it, 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 actually for the kids so extraordinarily good because they really uh, did bond during the kids? You guys were oh. kids at the time. You know, James, James, I'm way down here. You know, one of the things I learned while we were filming is that, and I learned it from each of these actors, they'd rehearsed for two weeks. And I started working with them when we were filming. And none of them were trying to be funny. None of them. They were playing it as seriously as I, I played Hamlet one time. They were so into these people. And I learned something from them. By the third day, I realized if I tried to be funny with Dan's lines, I would look like an idiot because they were not trying to be funny and I guess Dan had taught them you can't go with these lines the lines are funny don't you be funny it will magnify it into nothing and so I had to become very quickly very realistic with these wonderfully funny lines and they said don't be funny I that's what I got from each of even the kids, they were wonderful. They were so real. They hurt. Suicide was so into that role that he just, I couldn't believe it. And so we all played it without humor. Every one of us. And there are a lot, big cast. And I really learned from that. And when I saw the final product, it was funny. And boy, did I learn from that. James, I really learned from you guys. Well, and now I was there watching Clue like a, a hawk because I had been a great admirer of his work. And uh, I know, I, I, all I know is whatever happened there was a nice little miracle. Uh, it, uh, it was a small picture that has a lot of legs and uh, some good ones, too. <laughs> so I, I bless every single member of this cast because it was just a, a, a wonderful experience. I've never had a better experience of working with them, except for you, Don. You were a problem. <laughs> With that goddamn Luger. <laughs> I want to hear a rebuttal on that, though. Come on. But you know, everything about everything worked. I mean, the Tar Man is such an inspirational idea. And you have Alan coming in with that marvelous body work that he did on it. Uh, it was, it, it, every little thing worked. Well, actually, I played Except Tarman totally for laughs, but they cut out all of my pratfalls. <laughs> <laughs> did you, you know, and when you hit, when you knocked the head off, did you do it on one take? Well, that scared the heck out of me. <laughs> there was a, a little uh, person, a stuntman, a little person, and I saw him many years later, and I said, why did you do that? I mean, what if I hadn't been coordinated? What if I had just been, you know, a bum with a baseball bat? And he said, Clue, you know, I had to make a living. We have to do that kind of thing. And I, in answer to James' question, we did that in one take. And the head was sitting on top of his head, the prosthetic head. 
and I hit it as hard as I could because I wanted it to sail up, and I wasn't an athlete, you know, like a couple of these kids were really, you know, Tom and John, they, they can do things with their body, I couldn't. So I hit it as hard as I could, hoping I would hit the head. <laughs> And I did, and it sailed off. We did it in one take, James, and I'll never do that again because that, I shouldn't have done that. But I, Dan didn't know anything about that, and I didn't. He was the director. He said, you do that. I said, sure. Yeah, I can do that. But I couldn't. But we did it. We did it. The head hit Jewel. Yeah, the head actually hit Jewel. Well, let me ask you this, a little bit aside, but James, besides an impressive film career, you worked with Buster Keaton. Do you have any stories about Buster or memories you can share with us? Well, I can only tell you that uh, he was my boyhood idol, and uh, I, was, uh, I was working in summer stock producing, and I f took a chance and called him. And uh, it's kind of a long story. I'll try to shorten it. Uh, I, he worked all his life. He never stopped working from the time he was three years old. And uh, he just liked to work. And he had been one of the greatest stars in the world and then had gone into a decline, not because of talkies, Buster made it into talkies. He had other problems, marital problems, drinking problems. But then he came back. He made one of those great comebacks and continued to work. So I called him. Uh, I, I, a guy owed me money who was doing a book about him. And I, I said to the guy, um, give me Buster's phone number, will you? And he said, oh, I couldn't do that. This was the Players Club in New York. That I couldn't do that. I, that wouldn't be right. I said, well, you owe me $350. Give me the phone number and I'll forget the debt. He said, oh, here's the phone number. <laughs> so, so I called Buster and uh, I said, is there anything you'd like to do in summer stock? He said, yeah. I said, uh, uh, what would you like to do? He said, Merton of the Movies. I said, well... I'll take, I'll read it, and, and I read it, and Buster had seen it in 1919, and it was an 18-year-old boy that he wanted to play, and he was then close to 60. <laughs> so I was trying to think what to do, and I'm standing again at the bar of the Players Club, and in walked the man who wrote Merton of the Movies, a uh, fellow by the name of uh, Mark Connolly. <laughs> And I said, told him the story, and he said, oh, we must make everything work for Buster, anything to, for Buster. So he said, wrote me a, gave me a letter uh, that I could rewrite the play in order to have Buster play Merton. So I said, oh, uh, that's marvelous, Mr. Connolly. But I said, what about uh, your, it was co-written with, with uh, Kaufman. He said, oh, don't worry, Kaufman's in a coma. He's never going to come out. <laughs> which was true. So, so we, re, we did this, and uh, Buster turned out to be every boy's dream of what his idol should be. He was just a wonderful human being, hardworking, extraordinarily uh, uh, creative at that age. He never stopped changing the work. Uh, nothing was ever quite perfect. You tried constantly to go for perfection. Although it was never there, you went for it. And it was just wonderful. It was, it was, the, uh, it was the most creative period of my life working with Buster. I worked with him for the last 15 years of his life. And then when he died, his wife, uh, my, all the, my wife and I uh, sort of looked around, looked after her. Eleanor for many years. We just came back from the Buster Keaton Festival in Iola, Kansas. They have a big festival there every year. We've been doing it for about 20 years. So 
Anything you want to say about Buster that's good, say it. Anything you want to say bad, I'll shoot you. <laughs> Thank you for those uh, letters. So, while we're still a little bit off topic, Don uh, wanted to ask you, we were doing some research and some folks wanted to know, anything that you can tell us of some off-screen antics with Weekend of Earnings? said, I have to leave to help my wife be birth. And we had a very nervous AD. So he shot it in a long shot. 23 takes. They couldn't put a mattress down uh, for me to fall on. I got wrapped. The first thing you do, you couldn't do it. The stunt man told me, you think he said, drop down. He said, put one foot out and drop down let your ass hit the other foot and roll with it. And I still, that was, I mean, it was agony, but it was, you know, it was, it was terrific stuff. It was funny stuff. That was funny dialogue. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. But anyway, it was, it was just a late club. And the director, uh, you know, uh, he just let us go. One of the things that Brian Pitt didn't say was that, I don't think he said it, I couldn't hear you t too well, but he, he was late because he was working with Martin Sheen and Charlie Sheen in a movie. Did you say that? Yeah, I worked I work with them on a TV series called Anchor Band. Okay. And, and how was, said how was Charlie? Yes. Was Charlie? Was Charlie behaving? Yes, and it's interesting you say that because I have a message I'm supposed to deliver and I'll just do it in front of everyone. Uh, Charlie and James did a little movie together called Wall Street. And, uh, I don't remember that. Yeah. Well, you did. You did a movie. So Charlie, when I left him yesterday, unceremoniously, in the lurch so I could get on a plane to come here, and he knew I was coming to see you, I I'm telling you, Charlie lit up like a Christmas tree and was like, oh my God, please give James Karen my love. We must get together for a drink. I haven't seen him in years. And he goes, and tell him that it was so hard to do scenes where, it, it, they, you know, where you turn on him in the movie. And he said, by the way, that he's never forgiven you for turning on him in the film. <laughs> and I was paid a great deal of money. I know. <laughs> I never would have turned, I wouldn't have turned my back on him. But, uh, but no, but Charlie, Charlie says his love is dying to see you. Oh. To get a drink. And said that it was so hard to act like he didn't like you in the movie because he loved you so much in real life. <laughs> That's from Charlie. We had a very good time. Thank you. My love right back. I know. That was, you know, was what, that was a, like 28 years ago, and we're about 29 years ago. It's around the same year now. I think we were first. Yeah. Uh, uh, Wall Street was 1988. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, then yeah, we were we were before that a couple of years. Yeah. yeah. I was already damaged goods by the time we got. <laughs> well, talking about other projects, Beth, you've got a movie coming up with Eric Roberts, haven't you, Beverly? Mom, but we're not so good. So I'm really excited about it. She'll be out next year. And Brian and I. Oh, right. Oh, I forgot. Cameo oh, right. zombie parents in. Um, yeah, there's a, a, a pretty big movie that Sony is doing that's coming out next year called Kitchen Sink. And it has uh, zombies, vampires, aliens, and werewolves in it. Everything but the kitchen sink. And it's, uh, it's a little tongue in cheek and sort of zombie land tone. 
And um, the writer-director of the film is a huge Return of the Living Dead fan. And, and Tony Gardner, who did the split dog and the half parts on our movie, is the head of the makeup effects department on Kitchen Sink. And one day he and the director were just, were, you know, the director mentioned that, you know, Return of the Living Dead was a lot of inspiration for writing this movie. And then he had put a lot of homages. And um, Tony said, well, you know, I worked on that. He was like, what? Because Tony, by the way, still looks well. Uh, and um, the director was like, you worked on that? Anyway, so they got to talking and one thing led to another and Beverly and I, Mae Whitman, who's a great young actress who was on Parenthood and was in Perks of Being a Wallflower. She's one of the leads. She plays a teenage zombie girl. And there's a scene where she has a guy that she likes over for dinner and Beverly and I are her zombie mom and dad. Eating brains, by the way. By the way, but, oh, did you want to speak? No, go ahead. Go ahead. A word about our illustrious writer director Dan O'Bannon. She recorded two weeks of rehearsal. Great. And Dan, I noticed, could become quite volatile. When we went from book to physically staging, if he didn't think we did it good, he'd, he'd say, I'll show you, and watch me. And he would act out your part, which will drive most out of his batshit. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, this guy's something to deal with. Him. And uh, he did come from Louisville, and, and I did have a huge collection of guns. And so I thought, what in trouble do the director? So I did his speech mannerisms and voices and all that, figuring that he would say, Jesus Christ, that's just the way I want it done. <laughs> the guy's right on the money. I never had a problem with him. Uh, he was something to behold, but it was right there on the page. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a great script. And no, I did not know it would be a cult film. But I, I just said, oh, this is something I really want to do. And then I found out that I was in this company that just put all the fossils in. And I never worked with it. And this guy, when I think we did the, oh, God, the Joe Hardy, and the 29 crash. The 29 crash that Joe Hardy. The day the bubble burst. The day the bubble burst. Were you in that? <laughs> This guy, because when I saw the cast of screening, he, he played such a wonderful role in it. The guy who loses everything. And, and Except my take, virtue. In one take, the guy is told that it's all over, and his face dropped in his face. I said, Who is this guy? He's wonderful. Find out I'm going to work with him, and this was, uh, this was uh, an absolute trip. Oh, yeah, I mean it. When I told him, what about his take? He said, I went up in my lines. <laughs> I was... Go ahead. Go ahead, man. I was thinking of something else. I have to go back to Tony Gardner. Yeah. Do you remember what we did to him? Oh. We took... We took... He was about 18 years old, and we took 20 years off his life. <laughs> I, I have... I have... After Return of the Living Dead, this is, it really is very unique and crazy about this movie because, you know, we started doing these conventions and reunions about six or seven years ago now. And so before that, I mean, there was a good 20 years where we didn't really get to do this or didn't see much of each other. However, with the exception of the fact that I have roped James Karen into doing more ridiculous things on camera than any human should agree to do. I mean, I, I made this movie for $1.98 called The Willies, which Jimmy was kind enough to co-star in um, sporadically over a period of about four years. Actually, it was five years because there was nothing. I never heard a word after the we were some shooting, some stuff. And I get a call from Brian Peck, is that your name? Yes. Yeah. Brian Peck, <laughs> who said, um, do you know where that costume is, the janitor's suit? And I said, 
Why? He said, I got some more money. I'd like to finish the movie. So I said, yeah, it's in my closet. And he said, oh, uh, how about the glasses and the mustache? I said, they're in the pocket, the left breast pocket. It's true. We then went on shooting. Yeah, he hung it in the closet. And so there's that. Clue let me build the set for this movie because Clue at the time and his wife were living in a warehouse downtown, like a loft style warehouse. And it was the only place I knew of that was big enough to build the set in that I didn't have to pay for. So Clue <laughs> kindly let me build the set in his warehouse and also does a brief cameo appearance in the film, which we shot at, I believe, around 3 in the morning. And, um, and then, oh no, so the story was is that in this movie, we had to make a, a, a false head of Mr. Karen. And so Tony Gardner, again, roping more people into doing stuff for free for me, um, did a life cast of Jimmy's head at Rick Baker's makeup shop. It's a horrible procedure, by Yeah, the way. so, and we were doing not just the face, but like the whole head. So, I mean, we covered him in the alginate, the plaster of Paris. And at one point, when he's completely encased in plaster, you know, you can't talk or anything. So, you've got uh, straws through your nostrils. A couple of little straws through your nostrils. Yeah. And you have to be very, very still. Yeah. So Tony would occasionally say, you know, are you doing okay? You know, and Jimmy would be like, you know, kind of raise his hand or whatever. So at one point when he's completely encased, Tony goes, you doing okay, Jimmy? No <laughs> response. <laughs> Nothing. Jimmy, are you okay? Nothing. No movement. <laughs> Tony then looks panicked, grabs his hand and does this, and Jimmy's arm just goes. <laughs> We look at each other. I literally start, I almost need to be defibrillated. And so I was like, I killed the guy from Poltergeist. And Tony and I look at each other, and literally, Tony is about to lunge for the plaster of Paris and just like, you know, crack it off his head. And, all, and from deep down inside, we hear. <laughs> It's got to stay on there and dry. It's a, it's like a good like 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes of being completely mummified. Yeah. Oh, it was more than that. No, it's, oh, well, yeah. it's yeah. I had that done to me once, and it's uh, it's called a death mask. And it, it dries hard, and it gets hot when it's dry. It's, a, it's just, a, it's terrible. Do it once I feel for the Star Trek movies. Um, but, but, I gave, but I did give Jimmy as a kind gift. They didn't pay him anything to be in the movie. So I gave him his decapitated head out of the So one last question for James before we turn it over to the audience. I'm sorry. Uh, in Poltergeist, why did you just move the headstones and not the bottoms? Craig T. Nelson is mad at you. They're just... Now, James, for better or for worse, they're about to remake Poltergeist. I heard. I heard. I who, heard. Who would you like to play your part? Jewel's freaking out because she wants everyone to know, and this will come as no shock. She knew Charlie first. <laughs> All right, let's. Oh, when he was twelve. Oh, wow. Well, well then, uh, shame on you. Jewel. That's some take... nice present you gave him. <laughs> All right, let's take some questions from the audience. Here was a question, <laughs> gentlemen, <laughs> right up front. We got a microphone for you. Awesome. You guys made such an iconic, wonderful movie. A uh, movie that is, I know everybody here has deep, fond memories of, and a movie that every day is finding new fans, young and old and everybody. When did you guys realize, either during or after, that you were a part of something so special? 
I, I, well, for me, there's a very specific moment. For the 20th anniversary, so that would have been 2005, there's a, in Los Angeles, there's a theater on Hollywood Boulevard. It's the sister theater to the Chinese theater, the Egyptian, which was built in the 20s. And it's now become the American Cinematheque, and it's uh, the story, it's a, it's a, they show old movies, they have lectures, it's, you know, really great place. And they did a 20th anniversary screening as part of a month of horror in August of 2005. And we were all invited to go, we were all invited to do the Q&A afterwards. It was the first time we had done anything like that. Uh, Dan was, was there, Dan O'Bannon, Bill Stout was there, and the rest of us. And it was sold out, and it was packed. And I came around, the, I went and got a drink with some friends who came with me at a bar around the corner. And when I walked in the courtyard to go pick up my tickets, it, was, it looked like this. It was a sea of people. They had brought DVDs to sign, and it was a madhouse. And I went, what are they here for? And it was for the movie. And it was, that was the first indication where I went, holy crap, really? Wow, that's awesome. So, and then, and that was, it was after that that we started doing these conventions and, and starting to do all this. And I mean, the first couple of conventions, I was just like, really? Why? And now I've come to embrace the fact, you know, I just figure it's something I'm involved in can't act. But it's just, it's very, we're, we're all very blessed to have been part of the thing that became such a big thing. There's a theater in New York, the Film Forum, which is one of the most distinguished uh, film houses in the world. The fellow who is the who runs it uh, is considered the best film uh, pro film programmer in the world. He's used all everybody from all over the world calls him. And get so I was working with him at, at the Turner Classic Movie Festival last year on a project and he said that film of yours the return of the living dead he said i've never seen it uh, he said that you think it would work the film for him and i said well i don't know you've got a, a kind of a foreign film uh, egghead group there coming there i said i don't know and uh, he said well would you come and 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 do a Q&A if I showed it. So I said, sure, we'll be in New York in May, I guess. And uh, he put it in his programming, and uh, I was nervous about it because I thought, Jesus, nobody is going to come. That audience is much too highbrow. They sold out, turned people away, and we had a great time with it, and uh, people just loved the film. Loved it, absolutely loved it. And a, a nice nice time was had by all there. I was surprised. All right, we have time for uh, two more questions. So let's, this guy right here. <laughs> suicide. 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 Wait, while you're still standing, will Bert and Ernie stand up as well? Look, there's Bert. Oh, cheers, guys. There's Trash. Right Trash. Next year, I want a Scuzz, damn it. <laughs> uh, if anybody is wondering, I actually looked it up during the uh, panel here. Uh, Mark Venturini is buried in Hillside, Illinois, in the Queen of Heaven Cemetery. It is literally 20 minutes away. So it's, it's right down the street. My, my one question for all of you is, you can kind of, whoever wants to answer it can, but whenever you think fondly of the film, what is the one defining moment of the production that you remember whenever you think back? I, for me, I'm gonna, you know, it was one of my first, uh, it's not about what the, 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 the one particular moment, it's kind of the overall feeling for me, being an actor, and I remember, um, just being so lucky because working with Dan and his cast, um, it was truly a collaboration. And I remember going home after like two weeks of shooting, and, so, and, and my mom said no to me. It was like, because I hadn't heard that in like two weeks, like three weeks. It was like, and then I realized what we were doing, 
and I hadn't heard no, and everyone was like t looking and working it out. So at that moment, I was I was actually driving to work one morning, and I started crying because I was so happy to be working, and I, I guess I realized how special it was because it was just like, it was a give and take. It was such a growing, a great experience. So I think overall, it was just a, a, a great uh, you know family. And, collaboration and I, I think Dan and everybody here for that. I love you Tom. I, I, I mean it was, I was a, I mean all I wanted to do my entire childhood was be in a movie, be on TV, see myself on screen and I loved horror movies and I particularly loved zombie movies. So I mean I just remember a moment when I was there like hitting zombies with a sledgehammer as they were busting through a window and oddly enough that was truly like a dream come true for me. I mean, that was like a dream come true moment. And I was like, I can't believe I'm on set with actors I've seen in movies who I admire and I'm like hitting zombies with a sledgehammer. And then the fact that Dan let me come and help puppeteer the half corpse. I'm the one who recommended Tony Gardner for the job and he actually got it even though he looked 12. I mean, and I was the zombie crawling up to the ground. I mean, it really was for me felt like all the little Super 8 movies I made with my friends where I got to do whatever the hell I wanted. And the fact that this was a real live, big production, written and directed by the man who wrote Alien, which I had the poster hanging in my bedroom, and he let me literally do all of that stuff and help out and contribute, you know, it was just... Didn't Tony... Did... What's that? Oh, yeah, well, no, I had to fight even to get in for an audition because my agent said that I wasn't right for any of the parts of the movie. And well, you weren't. You that's true. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I'm still not right for the <laughs> Did, Didn't Tony make the half corpse for about 10 cents? Oh, he made the, the, the original company that was hired to build the half corpse of the split dog took the money and left town. And so there was this last minute scramble to get the half corpse of that split dog done. And um, I recommended Tony because he was a buddy of mine. He was 21 at the time, or 20, working at Rick Baker's studio, and somehow, yeah, he was 20, and somehow it all worked out, and he got the job, and he, he built the split dog in less than a week, and built the half works in a little less than two weeks, and by the way, was working on Cocoon during the day, so only could work on those at night and not sleep, and, and had no money to do. All right, one last question. You know, we can actually do two if they're, two? If they're okay. pretty... Before the pet flies away. <laughs> this is a question for Mr. Troutman. Uh, I don't think many people are aware that you're actually a very skilled puppeteer. And uh, I first became aware of that after uh, uh, Brian Henson did a, produ a production in New York consisting of uh, X-rated mature Muppet, uh, Muppets. Muppets. Muppet up, yeah. Yes. Uh, really funny. If you're it, right. Oh, it, it, it definitely is. I was wondering if you could tell us some of your uh, highlights of puppeteering and uh, any weird stories working with Brian Henson. <laughs> weird stories about Brian. Um, no, Brian is great to work for. Uh, uh, I um, I first started working with uh, with the Jim Henson Company back in 1990 uh, before Jim died. Um, uh, some of you, if you come by the table, you'll see some photos from uh, dinosaurs on the, on the table there from the, the, the series from the 90s. Woo! Yeah, I was, uh, 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 I was Fran's puppeteer, the mother, the mama. <laughs> I, so that was a, an animatronic character, so that I was doing basically all of the mechanics that are uh, doing the dialogue and all that. Uh, but I had been doing puppets, uh, you know, even before I did this, uh, back in college, I was uh, uh, working as a puppeteer. Um, and uh, I, I continue to do that now. It's, I, most of my work now is as a, as a puppeteer. Uh, there's a, a series I'm working on right now that you can go to. Uh, it's on this new channel called Fusion, which is not covered by many cable stations. But if you go to fusion.net, Look for Good Morning Today, you'll see clips from this uh, new series that's kind of really crazy. So I recommend it. Um, now, Brian Henson in particular, I don't know. Uh, he's just uh, he's just great to work for. Uh, we had a great time working on Puppet Up. We've been touring all around the country and uh, around the world with this uh, Puppet Improv show. And uh, uh, 
it's just been a, a tremendous amount of fun. So, uh, I don't know, was there anything specific you wanted? <laughs> anything, any no. stories? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> just out of habit, Alan would try and put his hand up our ass while we were shooting. <laughs> All right, Adolfo, one more. One more. All right, gentlemen, right back there. You know, it, I would think as generations go, that, that fame that would dwindle and we're being told tonight that it's just it's bigger and bigger. This is one of the same bigger. Yeah. That is one of the phenomena. Hey, you know I mean, what? The fact that you, it's, the only it's, criticism I ever, I, I ever heard about this film came from Jules Brenner, the, the DP on the film. I said, you know, Don, that first week's more caught my feet. Awful. I wouldn't say that. Of course, he didn't mean it. So by the end of the film, the subtlety of the fire. Of what I, I thought of this character. Oh, shut up. Fucking. <laughs> By the way, we all really want to thank you guys who are a wonderful, wonderful audience, wonderful fan base, and, and it, none of this would have happened without you. All right, I, I just wanted to say, um, I, you all were so wonderful, and I love this film so dearly. Everyone was so wonderful in it. And uh, I, I didn't get to hear Linnea say much, so I'm going to ask her a question. Yeah, Linnea, come on. I just wanted to say that the most memorable moment of this film was when Linnea came on to the tombstone and started dancing. <laughs> to this day, the cameras are rolling and people are just like amazed. She's so beautiful and interesting. I and mean, you're just getting I better. That was interesting, that's for sure. <laughs> well, well, you know, I mean, a lot of people call Jamie Lee Curtis the screen, the screen queen, and she's wonderful in all respect to her. But to me, you're the screen queen. Yeah. So. Well, thank you. And I don't take activity either. <laughs> But my question was, uh, whenever you're, you have your famous scene, whenever the bunch of old men get around you and start biting and eating you alive, yes. uh, what was going through your mind? I was just thinking of a bunch of old men start biting and eating me alive. First. They will tear. Oh, I can't tear it. <laughs> but that's what I started thinking about. You sold it amazingly. All of you were amazing. Well, thank you. A lot of good All right, ladies and gentlemen, one more time for the return of the living dead. Studios brings you a new concept in movie watching on the small screen containing some of the world's most interesting films by cinema's biggest talent, which will be shown and added to on a monthly basis.